Well, if you will, take your Bibles and look with me in Revelation chapter 3. And I want to speak to you about this matter of repentance. Repentance. This first message we're going to consider uh, together what it is and the need for it. And in the second part, to see our Lord's gracious call to repentance of his people. And I emphasize gracious call because that's what it is. If the Lord has called you in repentance, that's a gracious call. He's not left you to yourself. And I'll be the first to tell you, it, the way that it is produced and worked is not by the old hellfire and brimstone preaching that some of the old preachers and even some today think will get the job done, you know, just raising the voice and coming down hard and driving people to repentance. We're going to see that, that repentance is a gift of God that is the effect of what Christ has accomplished at the cross. And when he said, of all that the Father has given me, I'll not lose one, he is talking about the saving benefits of that death, even of granting of repentance and a calling to himself those that he's redeemed. But not even a one-time calling. I know there is that initial calling, but a calling and a calling again. Because the scriptures say, for by grace are ye saved through faith. For by grace are ye saved. And the tense there is you've been saved and you're kept saved by grace. Through faith. Faith is the evidence of being saved. It's not salvation. Where faith is granted, there's, there's been salvation. The Lord has done it. Let's read here. First of all, as I said in this first message, the need for repentance. In verse 18, and this is the last letter to these churches that we're considering here, we see the Lord saying, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. When, it, when, when our Lord speaks of gold tried in the fire, he's talking about his own sacrifice there. That's the only thing that is gold in this world, is, is what, who he is and what he accomplished. But it had to be done by fire. It had to be done under the wrath of God. God's wrath had to be poured out upon him. And when he says, I counsel thee to buy uh, of me gold, he's not talking about buying it with our works or buying it with our will, or buying it by our means. This is buying it in the market of free grace. <laughs> As Isaiah 55 and verse 1 states, Ho, everyone that is thirsty, come let him buy without money, without price. All right? So it's, it, it's a term that's used to exchange. You don't have anything, but come. Look to me. Look to me who finished the work, is what he's saying there. And when he says, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, he's talking about that imputed righteousness, which was put to the account of his elect by his obedience unto death. There was a twofold transaction, that I believe, and I believe this is what he's talking about here, that took place at the cross. There was the putting of the sin of his people to his account, and there is the putting of righteousness. That word righteousness means justice. There was a putting to the account of his people, a one-time putting to the account of, a one-time justifying, just like there's a one-time election, a one-time uh, redemption. There's a one-time justifying. There's a one-time uh, purchase that took place. And what he's reminding them of is, okay, You've gone long now. Let's let's get our eyes back on who I am and what what I accomplished. And he says that thou mayest be clothed. That's the only way you can be clothed with a righteousness that will satisfy a holy God. It's through what Christ 
uh, did in his obedience unto death, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now that's important. That means it doesn't matter what you endeavor to cover yourself with. If it's not the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's still nakedness. It might not appear so to men, but before God, he sees things as they are. It's nothing but those old fig leaves of Adam and Eve. It's nothing but those, those fruits that Cain endeavored to bring. It was still nakedness. The Lord told Cain, go and do that which is good. What was that? Go get a sacrifice. Otherwise, sin lies at the door. It wasn't about his attitude. It was about his offering. Now, his attitude, it was, it was one of rebellion because he refused to go. But the issue was the offering, just like here. Christ said that thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. <laughs> What's the eye salve? Well, that's the ointment of his grace and the goodness of Christ that's set forth in the gospel. Why does he so address these? Well, look in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. <laughs> You know, you've, you've been in a grocery store and you've walked by many a child maybe that's been a discipline problem and you may have stopped and looked and said some things, but it's not your child. You go on. <laughs> but if your own child misbehaves, that's how people can tell that one belongs to you. You're not letting it alone. <laughs> You're dealing with them. There's a, there's a relationship there that causes you to address what the problem is. And I believe that's what we see here. The Lord saying, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. You know, how many of you have ever supped with the President of the United States? Uh, my grandfather had the privilege of, of uh, supping with Lyndon Baines Johnson at the White House back years ago, and that was all. That was a big deal. I remember my grandfather and grandmother getting ready to go to that thing. It was, <laughs> oh man, from buying the clothes to the right hair style. It's all. How was it? How was she going to sleep on this thing the night before? And and get you know, dining with the president. That's quite an honor. But uh, listen. We're talking here about supping with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That just, that makes everything else pale. Uh, and, and this is the Lord himself desiring this of, of his people. That, when I stop and consider that, I wonder sometimes why I don't cherish more that this fellowship, how I need to be brought to repentance, you see. And the Lord says to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame what's he talking about there well he's talking about his death again <laughs> what he accomplished and set down with my father in his throne he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches so I want to speak to you that first of all on this matter of repentance and the need for it and I hope you see that it's not as men often portray repentance as a one-time act. That's what's in your mind. Let that be set aside uh, from this point forward. Many people think it is. Uh, in fact, when you talk to them about the need to repent, they'll tell you, well, I repented of my sins years ago. That's kind of the, the attitude. And what they meant was that somebody gave them an invitation and they were asked to walk an aisle and say a prayer and so the matter was settled. <clears throat> but uh, there are two points I, I, I would make immediately in answer to, to someone's responding that way. First of all, to repent is a continual change of heart and attitude and will toward God. You know when it says here in verse 19, be zealous therefore and repent. The word repent is in the, in the present tense. It's a command. So it's a command to continually walk with this mindset. And it is a change of mind. It's not an emotional thing. A lot of people feel like if they've had a little bit of conviction of sin, well, I've repented. No. You might have had remorse. You might have had made some 
some resolutions, but repentance is a change of mind. It's a way of thinking and uh, a change of perception or of thought and understanding. You know, how often in life we have to change our mind. <laughs> is there, unless there's somebody here that's not like me. You know, all the life you've lived, you've ever had to change your mind? Uh, I have. But even more so, the things pertaining to God. Actually, uh, let me tell you this. Repentance, understood in the, in the true biblical sense, repentance is synonymous with faith. They're the same thing. That's why sometimes you'll see the word used by itself here, repent. You know, but you look back in the context in verse 18. In repenting, what is Christ calling them to do? To look to him. So there's a, there's a change of mind with regard to, to where you are and a, a turning to Christ. A turning to him and to his work that he accomplished for his people. I know some of the times in writing you'll see the, the statement, repent and believe. You know, I've, I've heard that sort of statement, repent and believe. Well, they're the same thing. You've just, you've used a redundancy there. To repent is to believe. To believe is to repent in the true biblical sense. In fact, the only place in Scripture I believe you'll find those two words used, repentance and faith, in one verse is over in Acts chapter 20. And the reason is because they mean the same thing. When the Lord went out preaching the kingdom and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was telling them to believe on him. This is the, the, when the Pharisees came and asked, well, what is the work of God that we might do it? They said, this is the work of God that you believe. And here in Acts chapter 20, in verse 21, even though the two words are used in the same sentence, one is a complement of the other. One is explaining the other. Where Paul says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and... And I've told you many times that in the original, there's the word chi, which can also mean even. So it's an explanation. Repentance toward God, even faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know what true repentance toward God is? Well, it's faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Any that have never rested in Christ in his finished work alone have never repented. They might have come up with some resolutions not to do certain things or to turn over a new leaf, but there's been no repentance. Because repentance is faith toward. You see, there's a toward that's used here. Repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a change of mind, change of heart, change of, of will and affection. If you look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I don't want to just do a topical study here, but I, I want to say enough to where you can see uh, the explanation here of the term repent. In 2 Timothy 2, we understand that this is not something that is natural to any of us. What I'm telling you about, you know, you ask, well, have you repented? <laughs> well, I can tell you this, I, I trust God has granted me repentance. But any repentance that I have ever thought to have is to be repented of. That's why I need to repent again right now this hour. I need a change of mind. I need a change of will. I need a change of heart and affection. It, uh, it burdens me. My, the only, as much time as I spend this word and talking to people about Christ, how cold my own heart can become with regard to these things. And, and uh, I, I need that I have. <laughs> as much as anybody. I need, I need to buy this gold once again. It's like going to the marketplace and getting milk again. This is a free market of His grace being turned once again and again and again and again to Christ and Him crucified. I'll tell you, if there's that, not that turning in, in your heart, I, the, the only thing I can say is there's, there's deadness, there's no life. Where there's no affection, where there's no will, where there's no desire, after him, it's, it's just a cold, dead body. 
But uh, you look here in 2 Timothy 2.24, this is the ministry of a faithful servant, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. I mean, there's times when you feel like just taking somebody's head off, trying to shake them, trying to get them to see. Can't you see? And they just, they look at you with a blank stare, like, well, that might mean something to you, but it doesn't mean anything to me. But a servant must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, that means not only with the ability to teach others, but apt to be taught himself. Patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Look at here. If per adventure, God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What's repentance? Well, it's the acknowledging of the truth. And you do it with the mind. A lot of people say, well, you know, our mind isn't engaged. It better be. Come now and let us reason together. There's, a, there's an acknowledging of the truth of the mind, but it doesn't stop there. <laughs> Where God has granted the repentance. There's that doctrine that we embrace, but it's of the mind and of the will. We're brought to bow to this one that God himself has said he's conditioned all of salvation upon. And affection. We love him for it. Love him for it. Let the world hate the doctrine of electing grace, but we love him for it. Let the world hate the truth of the finished work of Christ. Someone stands up and says, yeah, but I still think my decision counts. It counts for nothing. It does count for something, for nothing is what it is. It's, it's of God. But the, the, the affection, I love this one that, is conditioned to all of salvation. The forgiveness of my sins, my redemption, my justification, my sanctification, all conditioned upon, upon Christ. That's the acknowledging of the truth. There's no fight. <laughs> There's no desire to fight. There's nothing but honor to this one. That's an evidence of, re of repentance that God has granted. And it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive at his will. So, yes, there must be that initial turning to God from idols, from the idea of a false God in our heart and mind, the idea that somehow my works had something to do with my salvation or my will. No, there is that turning. If you look in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, And the point here is that where there's not been this initial turning granted, there, there won't be any subsequent turning. You can't, you know, a person that's dead is dead. There has to be life given first. And I believe that there's, there's an important distinction here between the work of regeneration, in other words, uh, the Spirit giving you life to believe, and conversion. Conversion is always the result of having been given life. But where there's conversion, there'll be a turning again. But there's that initial. Like it says here in Acts 3 and verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted. All right? That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I don't know why the translators here use the word that, because it leads here that if you'll turn, then your sins will be blotted out. In the original, uh, the word that is actually the word unto, again, toward. <laughs> so what is it? Repent ye therefore and be converted unto. There's a converting to your sins being blotted out. And it's not that they may be blotted out, but that they have been blotted out. <laughs> Where were sins blotted out? Well, that was at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the ordinances that were against us were nailed to the cross and put away. And so a converting is to turn away from any thought of me doing anything that my sins might be blotted out to the one true blotting out of sins that took place there at the cross. So it's, it's the exact same thing as what we're reading here in Revelation chapter 3. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried by fire. What gold? That gold of forgiveness of sins that's already satisfied the death of the Lord Jesus Christ has satisfied a holy God. That's where I look. Do you need forgiveness of sins this morning? I sure do. 
Where am I going to look? Am I going to am I going to go down and go home and fast to get it? <laughs> well, you can fast, but I'll guarantee you, after you're done, even while you're doing it, you're going to have all kinds of evil thoughts going through your mind. There's no forgiveness there. There's no forgiveness in in the works of my hand. My mind has to be turned again and again and again to the Lord Jesus Christ, where He put away that sin. And I'll tell you, that's where peace comes. People struggling with this thing, they're, they're not looking to Christ. They're looking to themselves. They're looking to something they have to do to get it done. If you look here in verse 26, in verse 19, the word converted is used. Verse 26 says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. How did he turn every one of you away from his iniquities? Well, he turned those iniquities away from us. <laughs> he bore them in his body on that tree. Wow, that's where sin is put away. But there is also the continual turning and converting. I think this is where people confuse the terms. I'm regenerated once, just like I was elected once. I was redeemed once. I was justified once. I'm regenerated once. But when you come to the term converted, are we converted once? No, we're converted over and over and over again. I think it's because false religion has given us this idea, well, how many conversions were there tonight? That's the way they, they talk. Well, I, told, I hope every time I preach there's a converting that takes place in your heart, even as in mine. Because it's not a one-time thing. There is a ongoing necessity of being converted again and again which is tied to repentance just like repentance is not a one-time thing is faith a one-time thing well I believe so that settles it a lot of people think so no there's faith is not an act or a performance it's a persuasion who Christ is and and what he's accomplished even so with converting you know when I hear the it's like if I can liken this to, to sheep, when that shepherd approaches them and calls them, don't they turn their heads? They, whatever they were doing, their heads are turned. I'm sure you're probably bonding with some cattle. They're, they're getting to where hopefully when, when you go out there and call them, they're turning. They, they can see who it is and they come. <laughs> That's the idea that we see here. Look in Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. Here's an example. Peter himself. Remember the Lord had, had already told him that, that he would deny him. All right? And you say, well, why was Peter saved then? Well, it was because of the Savior. It wasn't because of Peter. But you see here in Luke 22 and verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but he said, I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. All right, so already there's obviously faith that has been given him because it says, I prayed for you that thy faith fail not. Look what he says, and when thou art converted, <laughs> strengthen thy brethren. Well, he's not saying when thou art regenerated, but regeneration has already taken place because the Lord acknowledges his faith. I've prayed that thy faith fail not. But when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. Do you see your need to be converted this morning? I'm talking in the true sense of the scriptures where our heart be turned again, once again to Christ, to his death. That's the call to repentance. And, and it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, because a lot of times you think of repentance being addressed to just a bunch of heathen out there, repent. Well, there is that need for any that are still in darkness to repent, and God has to grant them that repentance. But you realize in the book of Revelation, I looked this up, the word repent is used six times. And all six times is right here in these epistles to the churches. After this, it doesn't, it's not mentioned one time in the book of Revelation. That, that was a surprise to me. I, you know, it, it, with everything else going on in the world, who was this message of repentance addressed to? The church. The church. You look back here, look in Revelation chapter 2. Let me just show you. 
And it's interesting because there were seven churches that these letters were addressed to. The word repent is used six times, but in two of the messages to the churches, the Lord did not say repent. The one of Philadelphia and the one of Smyrna, he commended them. So they were at that point obviously being strengthened by his gospel and grace. But these others, they stood in need of repentance. Here in Revelation 2, 5, you see, what remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. And it's, it's the same as being converted. Convert, turn again to me and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. See, in verse 16 of the same chapter, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You look in verse uh, 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Okay, and then chapter 3 and verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch I will come unto, on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee and then over here again in verse 19 which we have in our text as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent you see only pride really causes us to think that we don't need to have our minds and hearts exercised uh, again to be turned to Christ you know some uh, sadly believe themselves so transformed that they never need a change of heart and mind they talk that way I'll tell you we need it every time we we come to hear the gospel if we don't see our need there something's wrong You know, any delay of repentance is really only strengthening of sin and hardening of the heart. That's what it is. It's like someone said, the longer ice freezes, the harder it is to be broken. <laughs> We've got this upright freezer that if the door gets left open a little bit, boy, it starts forming some ice. And I've gotten to where when I see that thing even getting close, boy, I'm, I'm at it with a, <laughs> a knife. Scrape it, while it's, scrape it while it's fresh, you know. Because the longer it freezes, it does, the harder it gets harder it gets but that ought to be our attitude you know when we come we say we come for worship that is coming with this this thought in mind Lord prepare my heart just like the psalmist said uh, search me O God and know my my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me any turning away from from the Lord some willfully flatter themselves in thinking that they can defer repentance to a later time. And here I would address to some who, who've never been even converted. I preach to a lot of people that that's their thought in mind. Well, I'm healthy, I've got a good job, and you know, I've got time. I've even heard some use, well, what about the example of the thief on the cross? <laughs> Wasn't he converted at the last hour? Well, it's like someone said that that example was given to us that we not despair, but there's only one example that unless we presume. And I believe that that is so vital for us to, for you to consider. You know, the thief's calling on the cross was, was a gracious intervention of God uh, in order to show the power and glory of God in saving the worst of sinners by the cross death of Christ. And it, but it was a rare confession. You hear all about these deathbed confessions today. I'll tell you, there's, there's only one that I can see in all of Scripture. Only one. Um, why? It's because the Scripture says, Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. And although true repentance is never too late by God's grace, yet late repentance is seldom true. You'll die as you've lived for the most part that's that's what we see so I hope you see here in this uh, first part of the message the need for repentance coming back here to Revelation chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17 we touched on this last time and the next hour I'll, I'll show you how God graciously is not leaving this church of Laodicea alone thankfully he doesn't 
I would be concerned if the Lord left me alone. I'd be concerned if there weren't these, the, the exercise of my mind and heart toward Christ. Uh, that's a sign of deadness. But you see, here the issue was what? Their lukewarmness. And that's what the whole message was about last time. That because of lukewarmness, there was a need for repentance. In other words, here were those who would not stand afar off with downcast eyes and smite their breasts saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. In fact, I wonder, when's the last time you prayed that? Did you consider your own heart before the Lord? Was that just a one-time thing that he was to pray there? Or was this an attitude of a heart? Well, it was an attitude of a heart. Uh, sadly, there, there are many truth straddlers. That's who really who's being described here. They, we call them fence straddlers, but truth straddlers. You know, when, when Christ said here in verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm, well, what's lukewarm? It's halfway between cold and hot. It says, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You can see the idea of spewing is, is the idea of distaste. If you've ever taken a bite of something and it's just it's got a terrible taste, you just go out and looking for a place to spit it out. You can hardly wait to get it out of your mouth. It's not anger. It's not the idea of anger, but it's displeasure. That's what's being described here. It's just it's distasteful. It's, it's unappealing. And that's that's what we see here. The Lord describing this state between cold and hot. It's like Elijah in, in his day there at, at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. He, he came to all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? Some of you have heard this gospel for some time. How long will you halt between, well, I, I, I know it's true, but. That's a sign of, of deadness. If the Lord be God, follow him. If this is the truth, follow him. Don't just remain lethargic with regard to these matters. If, if indeed Christ's death is the only thing that has ever satisfied a holy God for my forgiveness, then look to him. Look to him. But if Baal, then follow him. You know, you would be better off, really, rather than just sitting indifferent, you'd be better off going out there and declaring your rebellion. Just literally go out there and live like the devil and declare what you are in truth and let the world know follow follow hard after false religion if you truly believe that there's anything in works or will i will tell you go at it with all your might quit halting don't don't you won't make me feel bad by sitting here and thinking well i wonder if he'll, what he'll think if i go away go away if that is exactly where your heart is because that's where you're going to end up anyway suffering the consequences of that false religion. That's a hard thing to say, but it's nonetheless so. That's what, that's what Elijah said. There's no place for pretense or hypocrisy in the face of God and his glory. So go ahead and take your stand. That's what Elijah said. Let's put up or shut up. There's no place for hypocrisy. You know, uh, that's, that's being cold or hot. That's being cold or hot. That's, that's declaring yourself. But lukewarmness, walking around and making a profession that somehow you, you love and believe this message and yet your heart is far from it, I'll tell you, you might be fooling men, but you're not fooling God. And unless he grants you repentance, you'll die the same condemnation as people in works religion. That, that is the, to me, that's the thing that wakes me up at night and just caused my heart to be burdened for so many. Because you don't, I don't see the fire in the eyes. I don't see the, the, the desire in the heart for Christ. The, the, the eyes dry with regard to this matter of his death and substitution and forgiveness of sins. And uh, what is that? Nothing but lukewarmness. Nothing but lukewarmness. Oh, what's the need for repentance? Lukewarmness, but also the danger of being spewed out of the Lord's mouth. As I said, spewing is a symbol of bad taste and displeasure. And there's nothing more abominable in God's sight than sham and pretense in this matter of worship and things pertaining to God and His glory. If you look in Matthew chapter 23, 
really a message all of itself, but in Matthew 23 and uh, verse 14, you can see the woes here, and every one of these woes has this word, hypocrite. You know what the word hypocrite means? It's an actor. An actor puts on a mask and acts a certain way, and then when it's all over, puts, puts up the mask. Goes along and grabs another mask. That's, that's acting. There's far too much acting going along with regard to the things of God. And that's what Christ said. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. You know, going in and taking widows' money to support your ministry. And, you know, making pretense with long prayers. What does it say? Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You'd be better off running a brothel and just declaring yourself for who you are and dying in that state than continuing such hypocrisy and pretense. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass land and sea to make one proselyte. They're engaged in missionary work. Everybody says, well, that's a sign of the Lord's work. Not necessarily. There's a lot of proselytizing going on in the world. But he says, when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Why? Because the, the, there's not going to be any legitimate children coming from a prostitute. I don't care how many children a prostitute has, it's still an illegitimate child every time, every time, every time. There's no legitimate children coming out of falsehood and out of false religion. It's to be denounced. You know, but people like to kind of play both ends against the middle. Well, you know, I see these people over here. They're kind of moral and upright, and they really don't believe the gospel the way I see it, but at the same time, I can't say that they're not Christian. All that kind of nonsense. What are you doing? You're denying the glory of Christ and his work. You're saying it doesn't matter. You're saying it really doesn't matter. It comes, all it comes down to then is really being moral and upright and trying to do good. What is that? Works religion. Those kinds of thoughts, dear friends, are to be repented of. Because the only message that God finds pleasure in is that of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his finished work, and his imputed righteousness. I'm convinced of that more and more and more in my own heart and mind. And God help me not to have any thought that would ever deny him that glory, because that is the glory of God. That's where his glory is revealed, in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't being hard, it's just... It's just staying it the way it is. And I trust the Lord will grant us this repentance.